I thought that it would be fun though, just to sort of start off with um, a little bit of, of thinking and discussion about finding phenomena. Um, if you have been following trends in science education, there's this idea of phenomenon-based teaching. Um, so that lessons are, are kind of wrapped around a phenomenon. And I've, um, uh, sometimes I've, I've talked with some teachers and they say, well, that's all well and good. The only problem is, um, you know, at, at my school, there aren't any phenomena. Uh, there's no phenomena there that, that, that we can use. Um, and so what a, a lot of that kind of boils down to is how can you get yourself to look at the world around you and sort of and sort of see that there are phenomena worthy of our investigation and interest all over the place. Um, and what you have to do is how can you kind of rechange the framing of your brain to start to see those those sorts of things. And so just wanted to um, to um, I, I wanted to sort of discuss the idea of, of finding engaging phenomena and then how do you look at things in your environment to find something that kind of rises to, to that level. Um, does uh, that sound like an, an interesting approach for a part of our time together today? I've got some nods, I've got some thumbs up. All right, so here's, here's I'm just gonna give a little bit of framing around this, and then it's gonna be me stopping, and we're gonna be interacting and actually looking at some phenomena and, and, and things. So essentially what I do is as I'm going around, I am trying to push myself to, to notice things around me that I don't fully understand. And that ends up being everywhere, being everywhere, um, both in the built physical environment around me, as well as the natural environment around me. And with the, 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 the built physical environment, very often these things kind of will boil down to, you know, this, this is this way because this person decided it should be this way. And it's for this reason or that reason. In nature, things are, um, are often, you, you often are not going to be able to come up with a, a, a key answer, um, which makes it a lot more fun and a lot more interesting. So what I do as I'm walking around in the woods or in a vacant lot is I'm intentionally looking for things that I don't fully understand. And um, this is different than the way that when, when, I, when I was first training myself to be a naturalist, I thought that I'm going to fill my head with ideas, and then I'm going to go around and, 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 and information, and then I'm going to go see something that I know stuff about, and I'll bring the group over to that thing and tell them all the things that I know about that thing. Right? I thought that that was the way that it was supposed to be done. Um, and this still is a model of environmental education that you'll see in a lot of places. Um, one kind of name for this, kind of a pejorative term for it, is kind of the drag and brag, um, where you kind of are pulling the group around with you and you're just telling them all the things like, I know a lot of stuff about redwood trees. This, you walk up to the redwood tree and you start, you know, I'm going to get these redwood facts here, these redwood facts here. And then you can figure out ways of making it more engaging. I'm going to even kind of put in this thing that rhymes over here, it'll be a song over here. And, um, but basically I've got a bunch of information. I give that to you. So the idea there is that the kid is this, the, is this, this empty vessel and you can pull off the top of their head and you pour this information in and then the person learns. But what we're now starting to figure out about the way that brains work is that that doesn't really work that way because there's already stuff in there in their head. And if stuff that is coming in is different than what's already in there, the stuff that's already in there wins. And so with, you know, if there, when contradictory information kind of comes in, the stuff that already has a foothold in our brains, that gets, um, 
you know, precedence in, in, in kicking other things out. And, um, and, and, and also it's, it's, it's all didactic. It's all from my lips to your ears. And there's no, there's no engagement there. The people at the end of, I, I now believe that if I come away from the, from a, a leading a nature walk and the people that I'm with, um, will turn to each other and go like, wow, he sure knew a lot about redwood trees, right? Then I've totally failed, right? Um, I've, 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 I've failed as a, as a, as a leader there um, because I, um, there's, there's, I'm not engaging with them. But if I can find a phenomenon that I don't really understand and I engage with that and I play with that and we, we geek out about it, then this is, this is totally different. This is, this, is, this is real stuff. This is real learning. So um, I'm now looking for things that I don't really get. And when I'm nature journaling on my own, that's what I'm doing. I'm kind of walking around kind of going like, what don't I really understand? And there's lots of stuff out there. And then I decide to sit down and play with that and see what I can learn from my direct observation and um, the process of, of, of inference as I'm playing around with things. Um, so either through direct observation or inference, I'm going to try to learn from my own direct observation. But it starts with a phenomenon in the world around me somewhere. And more and more, there's a trend in education to, towards that, where we're, going to, we're trying to get more people to teach from the phenomenon, have that be the hook, and then we kind of build our, our learning around that. Um, what I'd be interested in is... Um, for is there is there anybody here who is kind of currently using um, sort of a, a phenomenological approach, and what are strategies that you use to kind of identify phenomena that are good hooks um, where you are? Um, Amy. Um, I, I think that everybody is currently able to unmute yourselves. Oh, actually, there's two Amy's. Um, you have Amy Sides and, and, and Amy, Amy. Um, and uh, both of you raised your hand at the same time. And uh, so uh, we'll just start with, uh, with, with, with Amy, Amy, and then we'll jump over to Amy Sides. So we'll be from Amy to Amy. Um, yes. I, um, I am a, a second grade teacher, second, third grade teacher. And we've been using that technique for a very long time by starting with the phenomena to just get the interest going for every science topic. So if you're studying weather, then uh, you might start with a video of some um, amazing weather videos, tornadoes and that type of thing. And then and kids will ask what's going on. If we're studying magnetism, they just play with magnets and, and observe something that's really interesting. So um for um for nature uh journaling i think what works really well with kids is exactly what you're saying is to just go out and and look closely at something uh that they may never have seen before and it might you could start it very um in a way that they're all looking at the same thing but then describing it in different ways um but uh, I I really feel like that's the way that uh, that that the kids are really getting it through that constructivist approach of just kind of saying I have no idea why this is happening but maybe because it's like you know maybe the furry uh, lamb's ear is like a blanket and then because it's like a blanket maybe it does something like a blanket would do for me for the plant so that type of thing. So you're using an it reminds me of there with that uh, phenomenon in that blanket example. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. Sorry, I need to silence this phone. Sorry about that, everybody. Now you're quiet. Ha! Um, um, and uh, Amy Sides, what, uh, can you extend or, or, or connect on that? Sure. Like I've worked in river conservation for a long time, um, taking kids out on the river, doing uh, canoe trips and river walks. 
And one of the um, activities we do is we'll uh, take a big net and scoop up a bunch of fish from the river. And then we'll look at the different structures. So we'll put them in little tanks so the kids can view them. Okay, what do you notice about these fish? And usually the first thing they say is, oh, I noticed there's a giant spot right near the tail. Oh, well, why do you think they have that? Well, it kind of, or what does it look like? You know, what does it remind you of? Oh, it looks like a, a big eye. Well, why do you think they'd have something that looks like an eye by, your t by the tail? Well, maybe they're trying to distract predators. Like, yeah, yeah. So, you know, just kind of asking questions to kind of lead them through observations, you know, okay, well, look at this fish. It's got a forked tail and this other fish has a tail that's kind of more of a fan. Let's think about the different areas where we caught those two fish. The forked tail was out in the current and the fan tail was kind of over here in this pool. Why do you think those are, you know, the one with the forked tail, what does the shape of that fish remind you of? Oh, it looks like a torpedo. Okay, why do you think that would be more advantageous to have that body shape in the current? So just kind of leading them through um, their observations and taking those, you know, we know what they're gonna say. We've done this enough, but um, taking those observations and just kind of leading them down a path to help them figure out for themselves why these different features and functions uh, work on on fish, and that's just one of our um, activities that we do. So, so um, something I'm noticing that both Amy and Amy are doing, and also this ties into what uh, Ivea um, is suggesting when she's doing things in the garden. She wrote something into the the chat. Is that um, you're you're so you're all using phenomena that are around you, but you've got some scaffolding with that about um, what you've got some scaffolding about kind of what to do when one of these things um, pops up to you. So um, that you're both intentionally using um, it reminds me of. You've got some some structure there to kind of harness uh, uh, harvest their observations. So you're intentionally doing some I notice. So I, I think that when you are trying to use phenomena, that having a scaffolding, a framework like I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, that the kids are already kind of introduced to or, or will be engaging with really, really helps. Otherwise, you can put the phenomena in front of them and they kind of stare at it and it stares back. But if there isn't kind of a deliberate process of what you do when you've got the phenomenon in front of you, then you can kind of get into this nature staring contest. Um, so deliberately teaching the, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, along with, um, as, as a part of this sort of phenomenon-based strategy, I think is, is very uh, effective. Uh, so um, uh, Amy, Amy Avea, um, what is your sense on, on that? Am I uh, on target there? Got some... Nods. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just share real quick that, you know, I, I do similar, similarly, um, but the, the teaching I do is for a nature program and we're outside with the kids and, um, you know, I'll have an idea of what topic that I want to introduce and what, you know, some of the lessons that are in it. But our focus is really, um, you know, away from that, um, you know, I like what you said, the, the drag and brag, you know, technique. And really, our program is about allowing the children to explore without us, like, asking too many questions, because that that can also interfere with their just exploration. But I think it really depends on who your students are. If they're not used to being outside in nature, if they have no idea what to look at, like you said, Jack, they're going to have the staring contest and, like, kind of standing there not answering questions and not knowing what to do because they just haven't had that experience. But I think that over time, you can get to a point where you might be able to take your students out and just let them explore when they have a little bit of that under their belt about how do I notice and how do I wonder because I think we want to wean them off of us always guiding the questioning. And But it's really important for us to do that and you know your students. So I think depending on what group of students you have, um, you know, as the teacher, we just need to, like, I know that when I go out, I have this 
this um, concept of 50 50, you know, that like maybe half of my lesson I'm going to have to throw out the window because their excitement and curiosity. Like, let's say I want to talk about the coffee berry plant, but, but we're so caught up in the scat that we found on the trail that I can't pull them away from the scat to go talk about these incredible berries, right? Even if they know, I know they're going to be engaged with the berries, but in that moment, reading the class and seeing like, okay, I got to change gears and I'm going to, we're going to explore the scat and talk about something you know related to the scat and maybe tie that into the lesson of examining whatever the whatever the topic was whether it's maybe it's a comparison study you know that we want to do maybe we compare that to something else but i think that you know allowing yourself to just read the students is really powerful because i've i've done it both ways i've done it where i'm like focused and like this is the lesson i got to teach it come on and just dragging them out of this thing that they're really excited about but what i found is if i just take that moment to allow them to just soak in that curiosity and wonder and awe that puts them in this brain space where they can receive everything that nature is giving them and so then i don't have to be imparting the information because they are learning through direct observation so i think it's this combination of what everyone is sharing and how do you know what to use at what time and i think that 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 comes with time it comes with your just you know your intuition of reading your students you know you're going to start to know your students much better over the school year and then just reading like what do they need right now and i think a lot of times my philosophy is you know i want the children to get a a personal connection with nature i would much rather them to sit on the ground you know, dig around in the dirt and play with the earthworms and bugs and leaves rather than having some, you know, like um, structured examination. And now I know that that's kind of hard in a classroom where you have these, you know, goals and things that you've got to hit. But I think that there's, you can bring some of this philosophy into your classroom, you know, and, um, you know, really model that nature is not only to study under a microscope, but it's also a nature is some, something to be with. Like to just, you know, take that in because I, for, for my goal is, I want that kid to be so excited about that scat that we found, right? And, and to be able to share that excitement with others rather than list off the 10 facts that, you know, that, that we've, you know, we've imparted on, on the students. Because like Jack said, you're, you're not going to remember it. It's like that excitement that, um, you know, and uh, what is it like the endorphins that are running through your body from that excitement and joy, it's going to help you remember more. So sorry, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, and uh, from Ivia and, and Amy, you got big thumbs up on, on those ideas. So there's, there's, there's an interesting idea um, that Melinda's just put in there, and that is um, surrendering to the phenomenon. So if the students have found the phenomenon, right, and I as the teacher kind of go like, I actually wanted to do this thing with this other phenomenon over here, but they're interested in that phenomenon over there. And then, you know, I'm trying to say, look at this, and they want to look at look, look at this, look at this. So then I'm fighting against the thing that has actually hooked them. And one powerful way of kind of reframing it for yourself is to say, is to look at this and kind of to, to, to say that, okay, oh, they have found a phenomenon. This is a legitimate phenomenon, right? And now how can we apply the suite of tools that we have to this to make more out of what is actually, you know, got their hook in? So if there is something in nature that gets its hook in, so sometimes you go out and you're like, oh, wow, this is really cool, right? Um, to be willing to, to go with that. And something that Melinda mentioned, she said sometimes that's not, you know, it might be diff more difficult in, the, um, in, a, in a structured classroom because you have your objectives. But something that's really interesting about the new science standards, the next generation science standards, if your state is using those, is that a full two thirds of it are general ideas that can be applied to anything or are specific science or engineering practices, things that you do or ways that you like asking questions. Um, a full two thirds of the new science standards are these more kind of general ideas that you actually could apply. You, you could start 
practicing asking questions and um, about that coyote scat and then thinking about where did the energy come from, from where is it going and those, those sorts of things. And you are now actually with that coyote scat doing um, two thirds of the, the new objectives of what we want people to actually, how we want people to be really engaging with, with science. In a future educator workshop, what I want to do is I'm gonna prepare a presentation all about the next generation science standards and how we can really leverage that, and use that. I love the next generation science standards. It's really, really, it's, it's sometimes you're like, like really standards? I really don't wanna hear about it, but like this, is good, right? And and so um, I'll we'll, cut, we'll we'll geek out about that. And by the time we're done, you'll be like, I love me some next generation science standards. But just sort of know that when you're if you're so sort of depending on how you're authentically geeking out on that scat, you can actually be hitting the state's standards uh, and science expectations. But um, but I, what I really like is your humility to kind of go with what they found. Something that I think everybody might want to check out is. The um, you're, if you're not already familiar with the Beatles um, curriculum from the Lawrence Hall of Science, um, B E E T L E S, maybe I can, I, I, I can never do acronyms. Um, but they have um, they've got a, a, a number of activities that sort of around focused on on observation and, and a big one that they do right after that they they. Uh, after they teach people I notice and wonder it reminds me of, is they just give kids permission to run around wherever they are and use this toolkit to find something cool and to geek out about it. And so the kids are out there, they're finding their own phenomenon. And what they found again and again and again, at first you're saying like, this sounds like chaos, I want, I need more control. And then, the, but, but what's neat is it, 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 it just time after time and after time, we're finding that it just works, that the kids will find a phenomenon, they'll use the toolkit on it, and they get really so into it that they don't want to stop. And when we've done th this with, with sort of test groups, you know, sort of instructors who are kind of hesitant about it, once they sort of see it happen, they're just kind of looking around and their kids are going around doing science in the way that we really want them to do. They're like, I never realized it was this easy or was this good, right? And so they do have that potential in them. So, does anybody work in a school environment where you're thinking like, it, like, like over years, the district has come through and done everything they can to strip this environment of fun phenomena? Is anybody working in a, one of these sort of like resource bare environments? Ah, we're lucky. Um, oh, so, um, um, uh, Katie, Katie Stein, tell us a little bit about your, your working environment. I don't think maybe it's that severe, but I think um, just having the uh, schoolyard, just grass and concrete uh, or asphalt, that becomes a bit tricky. And uh, when administration, we have a little pond across the street, but the administration is very reluctant to let uh, teachers bring kids because it's full of um, geese droppings and um, maybe she doesn't want them to be uh, traced back to school maybe she's concerned about it's a very small area where kids can be so she may be concerned about kids falling into the pond uh, because it, it, it's it's very muddy also so in, we're not allowed to take kids there so we have um, big we have grass yeah. And a couple of four seedlings of trees <laughs> that are barely surviving because kids are <laughs> really interested in touching them. So from this perspective, that is tricky because uh, um, I can teach the way I want to teach. I have curriculum that I have to teach, but I can pick the way with the, with the opening of the schools the way they are this year. I'm not sure how it's going to be. Because we're, we're now we're opening, just opening. Um, so I don't know, but uh, uh, having just, you know, lack of variety of our nature in our nature area is a challenge. 
So I, I absolutely agree with you um, that if you are in a place where there's this incredible diversity, a, a stimulus rich environment, um, it's a lot easier to find phenomena that hook you. And if you're in the concrete jungle with um, a few places of mowed grass and you can't go to the goose pond because there are geese there, because right? you can't go over there because there's all this nature over there. Um, that, that is, but that's, that is, it is, re, it is much, much more, more challenging. Um, so in, um, that, that you very well described, um, the environment around, uh, my, my, my daughters were going to a, uh, a, a, a public elementary school, um, Spanish immersion school um, by the, the freeway in San Mateo. And it was a lovely school. Um, teachers really, you know, into what they're doing. But the, the physical environment was exactly as you described. Um, there is a, a mowed grass area. There's an off-limits area that has some weeds in it. Um, and then there's asphalt. There were a few scraggly trees in the center uh, courtyard. And they also, at one point, some well-meaning people put in a school garden, right? Um, but then nobody tended the school garden. The school garden overgrew with stinging nettle. So they had these kids' planter boxes, and they were filled with stinging nettle. And I was like, wow, like this is this is some next level stuff, right? Like of all the weeds that would come in, it's like masses of stinging nettle and a little, few little oxalis even kind of sticking out every once in a while. So the, um, um, I taught, uh, that's, I was, I was teaching nature journaling there um, to, uh, to three different classrooms. And I was, it was, it was a challenge to try to figure out like, you know, with these resources, what can we do? But you know, I'll, just as a few examples, kind of, I, I looked at the, the 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 trees that were were had been planted, and with those over the course of the year, we revisited them at different times, especially at kind of key times of change, like when they're going from dormant to flower. So these were uh, plum trees to leaf. You know, there are these these all of a sudden this pop pop pop. So each week, pop pop pop. You know, you'd get these big changes. We could kind of get on those at that point. In the rainy season, the rain would come down, soak the grass, all the worms would come out of it and onto, onto the uh, asphalt. And so when that would happen, um, you know, we're out there, we're studying the worms, we're counting the worms, we're measuring the worms, or, and then even graphing um, how fast it took all the gulls in the area to go eat all the worms. Um, that was a really kind of um, fun day. Um, there were, and, you know, we could do some, you know, plant investigations in those. It turned out that a lot of the kind of unmanaged areas, the sort of the areas that were off limits, um, I kind of went through those, cleaned up sharps, and I actually found sharps in there. So made the environment safe. And then what brought, let the kids go into it. And, um, you know, in those untended areas, there was a lot more diversity that seemed to be kind of more of my target-rich environment for um, for for finding phenomena, um, but it is it is really challenging in those those sorts of of, of environments. Um, what are kind of how how do you as educators know when you see a good phenomenon? that you want to use? What does, how does it present itself to you? Uh -huh. Check out what uh, Linda's got going on over here. I'm just gonna spotlight this video for a second. So you- Okay, so let me talk about that for a minute. <laughs> um, the other day I found a, it turns out this is a, a kind of cicada, but I didn't know that at the time. 
So I've been doing the nature journaling on my own, but I'm hooking my uh, teenage grandsons into this being more like anything you notice is important. And if you don't know what it is, let's find out and stuff like that. So did I unmute myself? Yes, you're, you're unmuted. We can't hear you. Okay. Um, and so uh, I feel like I have a pretty tough audience with an 11 year old and a 13 year old boy. And even though I most mostly have been teaching drawing and my naturalist background is developing, let's say, through nature journaling with this group, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. it's um, we're also like as a result of, of this, and I, I showed him what, I, I'll grab my journal, my nature journal in just a second and show you what I was doing to share with them about my, you know, my crude and better drawings, depends on what, how it goes. Uh, but um, they were interested in that quest. They became interested in that quest. And so right now, like uh, we're looking at probably no really super normal return to school until November. I mean, they're gonna be Zooming, but, uh, and my, uh, their father is a principal of a grade school. We were talking about plans, you know, uh, how to get together with the boys and have um, some, our, our own little nature journal club. <laughs> and, and for the first time, they were really excited and ignited about doing some stuff on their own and then we could do stuff together. So uh, I think that, um, the, the citizen science part of it is where you're observing stuff that you don't understand and then you find something. I mean, this is so cool. When I found it, I go, oh my gosh, there, because cicadas, like we're in Washington state, that's not a normal thing. Uh, and so the sense of the climate change and other things that are like affecting the whole planet and then the uh, little tiny nibbits of things that are happening in your world and trying to get a, your, uh, like you're recording around it. So you guys have been excellent with helping me understand like get recording the date and the time and the temperature and stuff like that. And then, then getting into the exploration, like there was no like actually a picture exactly like this at first. And then I found a couple that were similar enough that I could say, okay, it's probably a cicada. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, uh, and so the so the uh, yesterday they were out visiting because we we're like doing a little the, uh, the social distancing thing with the families. It's it, we're crossing a few lines, and so they were out yesterday, and we saw these huge uh, hornets. And the buzz around Washington State is like the murder hornet hornets are coming, and so they were into that. I mean, they're into high drama, scary. And so we were standing looking at these bees, and. Uh, and then uh, I went and looked up to see what it was. And it turned out in your book, Jack, there, it turned out to be a golden, great golden digger hornet or something like that. But I had never seen one in my yard before. And so there was about five of them, you know, with all the other bumblebees and everything cross pollinating on the fennel. And so uh, just the, the observing with a sense of wonder, and I certainly don't have the answers, so I can be very humble here with that, like uh, how limited I can really teach, but I can teach the wonder <laughs> part and, and, and finding out how to get, you know, sources. So I'm here to listen to what you guys are doing, but I'm also here to share some of the hard lessons I might be learning, because I think that we're going to be going into this weird, unexpected time with, with not having school as usual. So how do you get get those kids sparked to want to do their own thing as much as they can and give them the tools to run, go and run with it. So um, that's what I have to say. Huh. Yeah. So I, I think um, Linda is, is giving us some sort of a, a, a key thing. You know, we may be going back to school and so kids may be doing things remotely and those kids may be in a, not be in a stimulus rich environment or your school may not be in a stimulus rich environment. Um, so then what are things that you can do? I've seen some suggestions on the side that might be um, people useful to kind of bring into our, our discussion about um, uh, bringing in uh, bird feeders and, and those sorts of things into a, a, a school environment. Um, there are some schools that have gotten into have sort of done that and then had issues with rats. Um, but but what, what are what are some other what are some other ways of kind of increasing 
um, one, one thing is to notice this, the, the phenomena that are there. The other is to, you can bring things in or modify the environment, right? So three different strategies. One is learn to make more with what you have, bring things in, um, or alter the environment so that um, cool things start happening. So for instance, you could have a, um, a you, know, you can create a, 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 a garden, you can create a sort of bird observation zone. All of those kind of take a lot of kind of resources and inputs from the teacher. But what are ideas that you have along those three zones? So either things from, um, uh, particularly, let, let's, let's get some more ideas of how to make your school environment or your local home environment a more stimulus-rich environment. The second is, um, um, or what are suggestions of kind of easy things to bring in um, to a, a classroom environment so that those things are just there in the classroom? Any thoughts or ideas on, on how to kind of pull those phenomena in? I was going to say, um, I don't know, everybody's kind of spread out, but I know some states, um, like you can work with, contact like your local, uh, like DNR or Fish and Game, because, um, um, and I can't remember the other organization, um, but I know some of them will provide you teachers with things like fries to raise, um, so fish, you know, baby fish to raise up. Um, and different things like that. So um, reaching out to some of those organizations and seeing if they have any programs um, that you can get involved with. Um, unfortunately, I can't ever take advantage of all that stuff, but, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, they have some really cool programs. Um, so you're, you're saying things where you can uh, get live things going on, raising salmon in the classroom. These are, um, there's, there's a lot of work that kind of goes into doing that, but teachers who have done that have found a lot of reward and ways to kind of tie different strands of their curriculum um, around those projects. Yeah, and then with like the bird feeders and stuff, like I know a lot of, um, like if you're tight on funds, uh, somebody mentioned Cornell does give feed, uh, feeders out to teachers. Um, I know right now a lot of their stuff's on hold because there's nobody working out of their offices. So like they're not even shipping curriculum and stuff right now. Um, mm -hmm. But um, also like your local bird stores, like um, Wild Birds Unlimited, places like that. Um, I know teachers have been able to get donations. I'm a huge advocate of birds because they're literally everywhere. Even if you live in the most urban of urban environments, there's birds. So like putting some bird feeders up outside of your classroom window so they can observe them, I think is really great. Um, and you can set up all kinds of projects with that and learn all kinds of phenomenon with that and do community science. So there's like a lot of really great aspects um, with birds because they're everywhere. <laughs> Those are, are very useful ideas. Yeah, yeah birds are, 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 are wonderful. Like mammals hide, but because birds can fly, they don't have to. So they're doing all these incredible things right in front of us. But we're, we kind of look at them very often. And we're kind of like, oh, there's, there's birds, right? No, but it's like, oh, no, it's birds. And so, yeah, I, I, Kath's got a really good point there. Sort of take advantage of uh, those, those feathered critters, critters when you can. If you do choose to put up bird feeders, also um, do kind of early on implement a kind of uh, cleaning and maintenance plan so that you don't create a, um, a place where rats want to come at night because then your school administrator will get on that and shut the whole thing down. Um, and so if you can stay ahead of the rat curve, um, that's a good thing. Um, what are um, some other ways of altering your school environment or um, kind of low-hanging fruit to kind of bring in. I know there's a number of teachers that will have, uh, or parents that will have in their, their house, kind of a nature table. Um, a, it's a table where you kind of put out a bunch of phenomena, um, and those can be, you know, some um, geodes. Those can be some pine cones. Those can be things that kind of make you go, hmm. 
So uh, I'll, I'll tell you folks, my, my kind of strategy for finding the phenomena, whenever I am going out, oh, somebody just mentioned the tree slices, the tree cookies. Tree cookies are great. I, actually, the um, Department of Forestry for a while had a whole bunch of tree cookies. They would send teachers these tree cookie sets of, of different sizes. There are numbers of sort of free resources for teachers, but kind of having part of your, your room be a nature table where the, <clears throat> make sure it is really dead and abandoned, the, the wasp nest <laughs> that you found. Um, yeah, you, you don't want it to be in a dormant state and bring it into your classroom. Um, and then warm it up. The, um, but my, my strategy for um, kind of finding nature phenomena is anything that kind of, I, I, as I'm looking around in nature, I pay a lot of attention to the very sort of subtle feeling of a micro surprise. A little thing in me that it doesn't go like, oh my, what is, you know, but, but I'll, I'll kind of, I'll be out looking around in nature, I'll look at something, I'll go like, huh. Right, so it's just a very subtle, right, little eyebrow raise. And what that is, is that's my physiological reaction to there being something in nature that is different than the way I expect it to be, right? And so think of like, the, Linda finds this cool bug. It totally doesn't fit what she's seen. And she goes like, oh, right? So she knows she's got a hook there. So when you get this, this, um, um, this little micro surprise in, um, you know, there's something here that you don't really understand. And that's the, those are the best things. Because if it's a mystery for you, it's gonna be a mystery for the, the kids. And you don't have to have all the answers. So people will start asking like, well, what is, what is going on with this? And if you're able to say, I don't know, that's why I have it here, isn't that cool? What are some possibilities? What are some possible explanations? For this. Let's see if we can start there. That's a, the way that scientists start. Let's, let's try to do that. So when you don't know, coming up with possible explanations, plural, right? Rather than what do you think happened here, right? That actually is kind of threatening. What do you think happened here? But when you say what are possible explanations for how this could have formed, it's open to multiple possible explanations. And then the kids, um, they don't have to be right on their first guess. And it's teaching them this idea of any time that you are doing inference, scientists always come up with multiple possible explanations for things. And we'll look at kind of a little bit more of that kind of inference process in another workshop. But you'll see that that ends up being kind of a critical step in it, getting people away from locking on to the first plausible explanation and coming up with multiple possible plausible explanations. Um, is really powerful. Let me show you a phenomenon. Oh. Um, so this is something that I was walking along, and then I saw this. All right, check out this little phenomenon. All right. Huh. Isn't that interesting? So, um, what, you know, something like this, um, you know, here's a phenomenon as... Um, uh, as, as folks were saying earlier, if you have kind of a, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of framework. That gives you a really rich place to jump off of in starting to explain what is, is going on. Um, so the, uh, isn't that fun? I mean, it's a, it's a cool little mystery blob. Huh. Um, and so anything that, when I look at it, I don't fully understand it, All right? That is, so you, if you just start yourself tracking mysteries, right? Um, that is, that is gold. That is gold for kind of getting yourself uh, either a collection of phenomena for the phenomena table, right? Your little nature table. Or for when you're walking around the schoolyard 
the same mindset, you're looking for things that are going on, not necessarily an object. Sometimes a phenomenon can be a process, right? Um, and you, you, you look at that and you kind of, things that make you go, hmm, um, that's, I think that's the, 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 the sweet spot. So my, my kind of golden rule for finding phenomenon is I will walk around a schoolyard and I will be looking for just little micro surprises. They're like, oh, that's cool. What's going on there? Right? So maybe it's the, the, where the spiders are making their, their webs. Right? Maybe it's the patterns that you're seeing of goals, gophers and moles in the, uh, um, the, 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 the spot out in front of the school. It could be um, the way that the things are starting to sprout and blossom in one of the planted trees on the site. Um, all of those are sort of phenomena in a place. And in, in all of those, you're intentionally looking for things that you don't have, you don't have the answer for. And very often, you know a little bit about it and don't let that stand in for understanding what's going on there, right? A little bit of understanding about something, like if you just think about, like yeah, we know the way that a bicycle works, right? Yeah, I know how a bicycle works. You turn the pedals and this thing and it goes, and you squeeze that thing, it stops, right? But really, right? So how does the derailleur work, right? And why is it that like, what's going on when you can pedal backwards and that's not stopping the bike on, a, on you know, like, what's like, what is really kind of going on here with, like I start to, if I, if I just go that deep below the surface of the bicycle, I realize I don't understand bicycles. Right? Maybe you're, you've spent time in bicycle repair and you're like, oh yeah, I totally know this, right? But for you, expert in bicycle repair, what about the way the flush mechanism works in the toilet? Boom, right? So the, um, oh, you're good at both of those? I've got something else for you, right? The, the, um, so uh, we have the illusion of understanding. Oh, everybody does. There's actually, there's been some cool research on kind of the, the illusion of, of understanding. We have the illusion that we really kind of get things in our environment around us. And what it is, is that we've, we have a very superficial kind of understanding of something. Our brain tells you, no, you got that. Right, because it's essentially not essential for your survival anymore, and your brain is trying to say, like, just ignore that and kind of go on to the next thing. But there's so much that could be understood and unpacked there in the physics, the mechanics, the decisions, the the processes that are going on there in all of these wonderful things. Um, and so that's kind of how I like to kind of engage on 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 finding phenomena. Can anybody add, uh, um, add, 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 add further to this? Or I wanted to um, tell everybody about the, I think, I can't remember if I talked about it on this webinar or something else, but the nature exchange we're doing this year. Um, so the idea is that the kids bring to class each, well, each week, um, like we're giving them a little box with some bug catchers and we give all the kids a ruler, a magnifying glass, tweezers, in their little welcome boxes. Um, but each week they bring something that they found and we have some things in place, like obviously no bird feathers unless they know it's not migratory because you know, laws. Um, so we have some, we have like some general guidelines of things they can't bring, but basically they bring something to class and then they swap with their classmates. So we're trying to encourage like starting nature collections responsibly. Um, and so they'll swap with people, um, not completely my idea. There's an actual nature exchange that's um, in the United States. A lot of nature centers do it where kids bring in items and they talk with the, the worker about like, this is what I found. And the more information they can tell about it, like the more points they get, and then they can use those points to get other things out of the nature exchange. So they did this at a, a nature center in Georgia and my kids loved it. And um, it's how we got a lot of the stuff we have in our collection. Um, so I was like talking about it with a friend and she's like, well, why don't we do that with our classes? And I'm like, oh yeah, we could totally do that. And the kids can just swap with each other. Um, so 
we're doing that this year, see how it goes. But um, that's definitely something that a school could easily do. Kids can bring in things that they find uh, and you could set up your own little nature exchange area in your classroom. And if you wanted to do it the point system way, you know, you, again, they could tell you about it, the teacher, and the more they can tell you, the more points you give them. So it also encourages them to research what they found as well. Um, so anyway, I love the nature exchange idea. And, um, and then, like I said, we just kind of, if you just Google like nature exchange, um, nature centers, you can find the different places that do it. And I just kind of copied what they had in place um, about like no bird nests and um, animals have to, you know, have been dead. Um, if you're bringing like no live specimens. Um, so anyway, you can just Google that and then find who's doing it and kind of copy what they have in place to make sure. And it also is a good lead way to like leave no trace and, you know, being responsible about your collecting as well. Yeah, and, and just to, to uh, tie in, uh, Melinda had the, mentioned sort of pen pals. Can you imagine what would happen if you started a nature exchange box with a school in a different state, or a um, if you're a homeschool parent and you're in one state to um, arrange a uh, to to do a swap out with um, another nature family somewhere else, so that your packages would cross in the mail. That's a thing, Jack. I've done it before, where. I got like pine cones and things from New York and like little bits of seaweed from Florida and it was so cool and I love that. Oh, so, so, so uh, um, uh, Amaya, uh, do you remember the name of the program that that was organized through? Um, I think I do. I think it was uh, Wild Explorers Club. I don't know, but I can ask my mom because she knows it for sure and I'll let you know. It was really fun though. And I had I had a couple other things to add. I wrote down to add to a couple things. So first thing I want to say is to Linda, good job. Keep going. Get those boys to Nature Journal. Get your teenagers to Nature Journal. That's important. We need more. Um, second thing I wanted to add was bringing things into the classroom. I looked up roly polies. I learned that lots of people keep some people keep roly polies as pets, but I thought, what cool would that be to watch them like over a day? Because they eat like all these different things. And so roly polies and they aren't hurt. I was thinking millipedes, but we probably shouldn't bring those in because the little stuff gets on kids' hands and they freak out. Um, things that make me curious is what inspires me to be, have the phenomenon. So simple things like if I find this rock that has this beautiful moss, I'm like, oh, that's really pretty. What's, what's going on there? And then I do details and I look closer at that. Um, other things that spark me phenomenon is if something po somebody points that out. And then other things that spark phenomenon is things that I really, really like. <laughs> like talked about this before with Jack, scat, bugs, Dead animals. <laughs> Those are my top three favorite things to Nature Journal. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can you imagine Amaya's version of these are a few of my favorite things? <laughs> so I didn't mean to interrupt you about that. I do. No, want that's to completely know. fine. That 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 sounds like what my thing would go by. So that was mostly it. Um, oh, one more thing for Kate, Katie Stein. If you have like a pond by you and you're able to get parents to come like once a week or something and you can go to that pond weekly so you can just look at that pond over time, that was an idea since you were talking about that. But that's all I had to say. It's so nice seeing everybody. Uh, my, it's so much fun to see you. I, I miss uh, journaling with you. Me too. I miss it so much. So it, it, it's cool. Um, uh, Amaya is um, one of our um, young ambassadors of nature journaling, and she teaches um, nature journaling um, to, uh, to, to families in her area and um, has a, just a wonderful nurturing and welcoming 
um, a, a approach. I'm just so proud of what you are doing, Amaya. It is really good. It is really good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, my friends, um, we've been here for uh, an hour. We've been looking at this idea of phenomena. Um, and as, as the, 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 the phenomena being sort of the kind of one of the, the keystones to successful nature journaling. So the, when I think about it, I think of you've got this act, whatever activity you're going to do. Um, you have the phenomenon. And the other piece of the third little piece of the puzzle is just sort of your building repertoire of nature journaling skills. And I like to think of the intersection of, of these three things. So with, if you change the phenomena, you use the same nature journaling activity. It's a totally different experience. If you have different nature journaling skills put on top of that, even if you're using the same phenomena, it's a totally different uh, experience. So that's why we have, as we're doing, nature journaling becomes this kind of bottomless pit of experiences that you can have. Because you, with the same activity, say zoom in, zoom out, you can do that with, you can do that with this, you can do that with this, right? And, and it's going to get your brain to explore and engage in different ways. So you change the phenomena, even with the same activity. So with just a small repertoire of activities, you can have all of these different nature journaling activities. And then again, you're then building the skill base of how do you, um, what are things that you can do in your, your, your nature journaling to make your, your, your process more succinct, more explicit, more uh, fun, more engaging? How can you use the journal page to get your brain to wrap into something in a totally different way? Those, as you kind of develop your nature journaling skills, your different skills in wrangling words and pictures and numbers, um, the experience changes as, as, as well. So as teachers, we want to be kind of on the lookout for the phenomena, right? And um, there are phenomena that we can collect and we can bring with us, and then you can have this little kind of phenomena kit. Um, I want to encourage people to have a, uh, in your classroom, a table of kind of delightful phenomena that, that you find and excite you, and then your students can add to this too. And that little nature corner can be a really productive um, part of your class experience. And then when you've got that sort of free time and kids are deciding what they're going to be doing in their class, um, uh, you know, you can choose to, I'm going to go, I'm going to do free reading or I'm going to go over to the nature table. I'm going to take a phenomenon. I'm going to bring it back to my table and I'm going to do some nature journaling about it. Um, gives a lots, lots of possibilities. The same thing in a corner of your house or if each of your children have their own, like on, on each of my daughter's dressers are these little kind of collections of found objects in nature. And um, they all have stories behind them. And um, those are really productive tools for journaling at home. And that's when you are in lockdown, when you can't go outside, or if you are in a place where um, you, know, they're, they're, you don't have a backyard. A lot of houses don't have backyards, but you can start to kind of bring your kind of nature experience indoors. All of those are useful strategies. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, We've got, uh, uh, Kathy's found a uh, link for kind of nature exchange um, resources and things. I want to encourage everybody to, um, I want to encourage everybody to check. Uh, if you want to make a copy of the chat, you can do that right now. Um, so you see at the bottom of your screen where it says chat, if you, um, if you uh, press on that, the chat box will pop up. You'll see a little box with three dots. And um, you can click at the top of that save chat. And then all the little um, ideas that people have put in, that will be a reference for you to use as you wish. Um, I hope that this was a useful workshop for you in thinking about your own strategies for teaching nature journaling. Um, it's going to be a very interesting year. And um, something that I think is really going to, to help us 
is to start thinking now about how we can get um, a phenomenon in front of a child that will stimulate their, um, their brain and their heart, their curiosity. Um, we can start to collect those. Again, you can modify your school environment. You can um, bring things into your classroom and you can train yourself to look around the environment uh, that you're in and see the phenomena that are there before you.